You know, a show I remember growing up with and decided to use some looking back on is The Weekenders. And that's not just for the fact that it's a paid request by Kenneth David Bird on my Patreon. <laughs> but seriously, I do fairly remember growing up with The Weekenders. It was more or less a simple slice of life series created by Doug Langdale, who had a major influence in Disney's television department by working on shows like Darkwing Duck, Aladdin the Series, and creating non-Disney shows like Earthworm Jim. The Weekenders had a simple premise that focused on a group of four preteens named Tino, Carver, Lore, and Tish hanging out over the weekend and dealing with some small teenage dilemmas, usually learning some type of lesson by the end of the episode. It managed to run for four seasons on Toon Disney and had a good selection of veteran voice actors on board. I know we like to look back on old properties to see if it holds up, so I think it's only fair that The Weekenders gets a look back as well. So let's take a look at a few episodes to see if this show still holds up. This is Deep We start on the first episode as we open on a Saturday afternoon on the beach where a woman gets injured by a crab, a baby gets killed by a beach ball, and a weightlifter pulls a muscle. Jesus, five seconds in and there are already so many casualties. Disney was pretty dark back in the 2000s. We're then introduced to one of the main characters named Tino, voiced by Jason Marsden, as he gives his own introduction. Hi, it's Tino. Anyway, check it out. It is Saturday and we're at the beach. And I got enough junk food to choke a goat. <laughs> what more could you want? And apparently he finds goat killing to be a fun weekend activity. I guess to each their own. Tino meets up with his friends and gives them their specific snacks while bragging about how synchronized they are. We've spent nearly every weekend together since first grade. We are synchronized. Okay. The group then goes over to the mall where they're now at the food court. Even though they just ate. Boy, these characters are a lot more gluttonous than I remembered. Tish, voiced by Kath Susie, and Lore, voiced by Greg Griffin, walk away to find a table, but not before Lore sees her crust, Thompson Oberman. Lore then talks to Tish about getting Thompson to love her. I've got 28 hours to figure out how to get him to notice me. I know! I'll write him a love poem for you! Uh-huh. And how will me dying of embarrassment help? You know, this just screams typical preteen drama. But anyway, Lauren Tish continue talking while Tino and Carver, voiced by Phil Lamar, walk over and overhear certain parts of Lauren Tish's conversation. Carver mishears Lore saying she needs him to love her, not knowing she was talking about Thompson. That alone is pretty indicative of what type of plot we're getting. The simple misunderstanding trope. I get it's a slice of life series from the 2000s, but do we really need to do this? It doesn't help with the fact that Carver freaks out about it and fears it'll destroy the group dynamic like that trope always entails. This could change everything! No more ultimate weekends. No more synchronization. So Tino and Carver decide to ignore the problem and hope it goes away. But they find that to be too difficult because they won't let Lore finish any of her sentences. Carver, I need you. Ah! Okay, what's up with him? Uh, he had to run home suddenly for, uh, reason. And so do I. Well, tell Carver I need him to- Right, you need him and, and, and I got it. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, the obvious reason why this trope should have died the moment it was created. This scenario wouldn't really happen. Even in cartoon form, it's contrived because all you have to do is literally talk and then the problem is solved. But whatever, the boys go over to Tino's house to contemplate how much this development will ruin their weekends. I prepared a chart showing how this would affect us. As you can see, it indicates that within three weeks, our fun levels will plunge to record lows. Interesting. And how did you obtain your data? Made it up. I see. Hey, keep that up and you can have a promising career at the Daily Wire. Tino has a talk with his mom and is the only one with common sense here. Carver needs to look deep inside himself to see how he feels. Then talk to Laura about his feelings and hers. Gee, that's great advice, Mom. Too bad Carver's a guy. So the chances of him talking about anybody's feelings are like zero and in infinity. Yeah. I mean, you're not too wrong, but I don't feel like having a bunch of anti-SJWs on this video, so I'll do like them and pretend it's not a problem. The next day comes as Carver and Tino meet up and think of a way to get Laura to end her crush. They come to the conclusion that they need to replace Laura. Well, 
I guess we'll just have to do it. Talk to Laura? No. Start looking for someone to replace her. What are you, nuts? Sorry, lost my head. That was cold Meanwhile, the girls are having Tish's mom give Laura a makeover. Somehow, she ends up looking like a Harley Quinn design reject. Tish shows off one of her poems she came up with Laura to use on Thompson. My love is like a perinecium. It divides and reproduces. It's covered with wriggling hair like cilia and full of high protein juices. Uh, uh, what part didn't you like? The part where you were talking? Huh, I'll admit, that was fairly funny. Though that does make me notice something about this show is that its humor is pretty laid back and slow moving. I can't say it feels like this is what it was like the whole time. Even when I was a kid, nothing big in terms of laughs, just a pretty mellow series. Continuing on, we skip ahead to Tish and Lore trying on dresses at a department store. Well, what do you think? Too classy. Tish, I'm dressed exactly like you. You're right, it's too classy. Well, that was pointless. Like, there was no reason for that scene at all other than to fill up the runtime and give us that small time joke. Tish and Lore go to the arcade and end up meeting Thompson, which is another useless scene. Seriously, is this series all about wasting time? I get they're teenagers, but do we really need our time wasted? Granted, we are just watching a cartoon and you guys are watching a guy review said cartoon. So the boys go to Tino's mom to ask her to be a replacement for Lore, which garners her anger. All this, just so you won't have to talk to Lore. Um, pretty much. You know what? Well, I, I don't want to hear it. You can't ruin your friendship with Laura just because you don't want to discuss feelings. If you do, I'll... I'll... Oh, I'll have you arrested! In this day and age, that probably wouldn't be too difficult. Your mom's really mad. Carve? Yeah? I think she's right. Excuse me? Well, think about it. Why are we avoiding Laura? Duh, because we don't want things to change. I know, but not hanging with Laura is like the most gigantic change possible. The only chance we have of salvaging our group is if you talk to Laura about feelings. Kind of anticlimactic to come to that conclusion, but whatever gets us to move forward. So Carver and Tino finally confront Laura over her feelings, and the scene plays out in a typical yet somewhat funny way. Oh my gosh, you think I'm in love with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Carver, but you're like my brother or something, and you know, ooh. You were cold as ice. So the gang reconciles, and Tino gives his final words about the whole shebang while also showing off his psychic abilities. Check it out. Three, two, one, zero. <laughs> Later days. And that's the end of the episode, and I have to say that was pretty boring. There was nothing really that spectacular about it. It was kind of just teenagers hanging around having a very teenager problem and then coming to a simple solution and that's just it. Nothing big, spectacular, or amazing even happened. I'm just kind of like, really? I mean, yeah, it's a slice of life, but you still kind of want a little more, don't you? Like, I don't know. There has to be something a bit more exciting and enticing about this series. Maybe there's something more enticing in another episode. The episode opens on a Friday where Carver is sitting in front of his locker reading a love note he got from a secret admirer, and apparently they have a very limited vocabulary. You are one of the most talented, gifted, level-headed, gifted, well-dressed, and gifted guys I've ever known. The question is, who wrote it? Everyone is a suspect. Even you. No, not you, her. The one with the glasses and the halter top. And apparently Carver's gone delusional, but anyway. We transition to a gladiator-themed pizza joint that changes theme every episode. A pretty simple running gag they have, nothing that funny, but can get a light chuckle every now and then with some of the little weird ideas they come up with. Inside, the gang is sitting down and discussing Carver's secret admirer. So, what'd the note say? I don't remember exactly, but the word gifted was used repeatedly. Uh-oh. We'd better get to Carver before trying to guess who his secret admirer is liquefies his brain. The gang meets up with Carver completely zonked out of his mind, and they bring him back to reality as he describes what he thinks his admirer looks like. I bet she had red hair. No, make that dark brown with a ponytail, and definitely not so tall. Now, smaller ears, perk your nose, eyes further apart, Oh, we're so close. 
You're imagining your perfect woman, and all you talk about is how she looks. And you can't believe this because... I've solved the mystery. Carver's secret admirer is no one! Huh? The note says talented, gifted, level-headed. Obviously, it was meant for Thompson Oberman, not you. I'm thinking Carver's mom left the note to boost his confidence. Or maybe there's more than one Carver. It's a very popular name these days. Damn, not one of them believes his admirer is legit. And again, it's hard to believe someone would be attracted to somebody who gets his hair designed by SpongeBob's home decorator. Carver gets mad that his friends doubt his love life and vows to find his admirer. I'm gonna find this mystery girl if I have to stake out my locker all weekend waiting for the next note. I give you 10 points for level of commitment, but 5 point penalty for forgetting school is closed on the weekend. Oh, yeah. Sloppy stowage, 15 point penalty. We should have never given her that whistle. Oh uh, yeah, that's right. Whenever the show is done with a scene, they go off on an out-of-nowhere joke. A lot of them range from mediocre to just lame. They just feel like something that was just there to fill the space. But I digress. We cut to the next day where the gang is looking through a yearbook to see who Carver's potential soulmate is. Yes! 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 Carver! Every single time Tino points to a cute girl, you think it's her. But when it comes to the more appearance-challenged girls, you look like you swallowed a snail. Yeah! Ew. And do you know why? Because you are an S-N-O-B-B. Snobbub? S-N-O-B-B. It stands for Snooty Nitwit Overcome by Beauty. Ha! <laughs> Got <he. laughs> So after getting roasted by Tish, Carver receives another letter from his admirer praising him. You are creative, handsome, and dynamic. You should get a government grant just for being you. You lie! You lie! So Carver goes around town to ask people if they wrote the note. We're not allowed to talk to strangers about spelling or punctuation. <laughs> what type of parental rule is that? So does that mean y'all can talk to strangers on a technicality? Hey girls, you wanna get in my van? Well, Becky, he never said anything about spelling, so this should be fine. <laughs> Carver gives up searching and sulks in a tree in a park, and he gets approached by this really tall girl named Nona, who confesses that she wrote the note to him. Carver's stunned by how tall the girl is and starts fantasizing about life as a couple. Okay, I don't care how strong you think you are, you're not surviving that baby coming out of you. Your cooch will be more open than the Sun Doom Cave. Carver runs away from Nona and tells his friends about his encounter. Carver reveals that he can't date Nona because he'll be made fun of. She's just so tall. Everyone would make fun of me. Everyone makes fun of you anyway. Ever since that thing with the fire hose and the poodle. Nothing was ever proven. A thing I notice about the dialogue with the show is it can be a bit off-brand some of the time. It really does go by that quirky style that can kind of help keep things from getting too monotonous, especially when visually there's not much going on. I mean, this animation and design is pretty bland and forgettable. It honestly reminds me of something off of PBS Kids, but somehow more basic. But back to the episode. Carver gets chewed out again for being so shallow. The next day comes as Carver gets a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> Check it out! Mr. Pineapplehead is having a family reunion! <laughs> hey, ouch! <laughs> I wonder how much he costs per pound! Man, I wish my head were full of juicy tropical goodness! <laughs> Pause. I know this guy in the middle is not trying to clown on someone when he doesn't even have a neck. This boy looks like he should be guiding traffic. Boy, seriously, do you share blood with Jabba the Hutt? You look like you buy the same clothes from the same retailer. Casual male quintuple XL. Speaking of which, how do you keep a shirt on when you ain't got no shoulders? Your body is a sin against nature, defying the laws of physics. Defying the laws of gravity. So in the end, Carver learns his lesson from being ridiculed and goes to apologize to Nona. These guys at the market said that my head looked like a pineapple, and I got to thinking... Oh my gosh, it does look like a pineapple. <laughs> I mean, how interesting. Did I mention I'm afraid of pineapples? Not that you're a pineapple. Actually, I'm mainly afraid of coconuts. <laughs> okay, bye. Can you believe it? She ditched me because of the shape of my head. Huh. Now I do know something about her as a person. She's totally shallow. Like me. Hmm. Suddenly I'm kind of interested. Later days. Nona. Nona! Wait up! 
And that's the end. I gotta say, that wasn't that great either. Man, this show was a lot more simple than I remembered. Which, honestly, I think holds it back to a degree. Nothing in this series really stands out. The characters' interactions could be a little fun with their off-brand dialogue, but a lot of the times they're just sitting around talking. I know it's a slice of life series, but that's gotta be a bit more engaging. The animation can move decently, but it's definitely nothing to try to remember. The personal problems are solved in too anticlimactic of a way. They just simply have a problem that gets resolved fairly easily with not much of a struggle, so you're not that invested in it. The show's not too over the top, but that's what hurts it the most. There's no big draw to anything going on. I could understand why it's not brought up too much in nostalgia posts on social media, because there's nothing that spectacular about it. A certain thing I'm starting to remember about this was that it was mostly just a noise series, something you just had on but not something you really paid attention to. You just have it on in the background while you're doing something else. And that's just something that won't really fly in this time. While not the most offensive thing, it's ultimately just harmless, which is just too little in a time and age where weird is the new norm. It's not the worst, but it's definitely far from the best. <sighs> that does it. I'm making a fish. Forget it. We're out of here. And that's the review. Thanks for joining me, and always remember, it's just a deep thought.